Hello and welcome everybody to episode 24. This is the year in review of 2014. My name is Jamie Hari from the Marvel and DC databases. Um, it's a great and fantastic and special episode we've got for you this week. Uh, joining me are uh, Kyle, Billy, Rab, and Justice. Uh, we're going to talk about all some of our favorite things in the comic book industry in 2014. And we're going to tell you not only some of our favorite moments, uh, but uh, you know, we'll have a little bit of a discussion about how, why they were important and uh, and what you think as well. So um, just to begin, uh, we're actually going to start with Justice. Uh, Justice is going to tell us a little bit about uh, thoughts on uh, Green Knight, I think. Um, and then we're going to have a little bit, of, uh, after each topic, we're going to spend a second just to telling you uh, our thoughts. So take it away, Justice. Uh, thank you so much. Here we go. Uh, yeah, so for this uh, year in review, I'm going to talk about what is probably my favorite comic of 2014. Uh, Warren Ellis, uh, Declan Shalvey, and Jordi Bellier on Moon Knight. Like, I mean, it's Moon Knight. You know, he's sort of a Batman ripoff, works in Marvel. It's crazy. Um, so I see Warren Ellis is working on a Moon Knight book. I'm like, cool, Warren Ellis, he's a talented dude, but I don't expect that much. Then... Every single issue gets better and better and better. It's, oh, like, I can't even put into words how good the writing, the art, just everything about this book is. And it's always, what, 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 what's so great about it is it's always good in different ways. Like, the first, the first issue is sort of a very Marvel Comics, like, murder, mystery, crime, investigation thing. And then there's like a crazy serial killer story and this weird psychedelic thing and that he beats up ghost punks and there's the crazy, the raid style action scene. It's amazing and sort of <coughs> half tragically, half magically, it's only six issues. The team, That team that I mentioned, those three guys worked on it for six issues then left and it's... It's one trade, one trade paperback, and it's just an amazing package. Like, it just does stuff with comics <coughs> as an art form that, like, blow my mind. I feel like uh, like Marvel's been doing a lot lately with big creative revivals of smaller characters just by putting top-name creators and letting them go oh, yeah. nuts on yeah. old properties that traditionally haven't done as well. Yeah, they're going Hawkeye on a lot of stuff, and it's done well for, like, yeah, that Moon Knight, She-Hulk... Uh, well, Daredevil was before, but it's sort of in the same vein. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's been great stuff, but Moon Knight is easily my favorite of that line, and it's just been... It's... My God. Yeah, they keep going back to that, like, uh, creative formula, business strategy, and it seems to be working a lot for them, and I'm hoping oh, yeah. there's more of a shift in that direction. Oh, yeah, hey, that... You, you mentioned She-Hulk, and she I think Charles Soule's doing She-Hulk, and there's some yeah, really interesting yeah. things going on there. A uh, uh, courtroom battle scene between uh, Daredevil and She-Hulk, I think it was uh, something that okay. as well. So lots of uh, right. interesting things. Um, <clears throat> definitely a solid book. Uh, you know, obviously Moon Knight is no stranger to uh, you know having his own title. Uh, Mark Spector, uh, probably one of my favorite characters as well. So um, yeah. okay, uh, we'll move right along. Uh, Kyle, I think you were going to tell us a little bit about uh, Constantine. Is, uh, is that right? Yeah, uh, Constantine uh, TV show debuted long, and uh, I'm I'm not a big Constantine fan or, or reader anyway, so this is kind of my first exposure to the character and to his his world, other than a few crossover things that he's been in. And I've thought it, it's been really good. Uh, Matt Ryan is the the actor that plays Constantine, and I think as far as everything I've read with him, the little bit that it is, he's the perfect choice. He's you know, he's kind of sarcastic, and he kind of has a little bit of that con man feel. And um, uh, if you're not familiar with the show, he's basically kind of this con man, uh, supernatural exorcist type guy that goes around kind of, you know, it seems like in the TV show more, he's kind of sucked into this life of battling, you know, demons and, and other supernatural threats without really wanting to have to do it. But he's kind of he's kind of stuck like that. And it kind of has the same feel as like if you're familiar with supernatural, it kind of has this, a similar vibe to it. Um, maybe a little bit more dark than Supernatural, but um, I think it's definitely an underrated show. Uh, like Flash and Gotham have gotten a lot more hype than Constantine, but I think it's definitely worth checking out if you haven't been. 
It's uh, I've been saying Constantine is. It's like they got Gordon Ramsay to play Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's like every episode of Constantine's just it's just kitchen nightmares, but instead of kitchen nightmares, it's literal horrifying demons, regular nightmares, which I think is what Gordon Ramsay should have been doing all along. I think as a fan of Hellblazer and Constantine, I'm I, I was kind of disappointed, but I, I think part of that is because I went to like New York Comic Con and then they had like a sixty foot high. Constantine poster, and I'm like, this is going to be amazing. And then I watched it, and it was just kind of okay. So I'm hope. I mean, I haven't watched it all the way through, and I really should have as a fan. But if I had given, if I give it more of a fair shake, hopefully it will stick around long enough for me to uh, get into it. I think to, a lot fair, of... to be fair, I think the first episode or two start out pretty slowly, but I think it picks up and it kind of gets in its own groove as the show gets going, and I think it gets better as it goes along. Kyle, what did you think about uh, the show in comparison to the movie? Uh, I think it's much better than the movie. Um, one, because Keanu Reeves, I don't think, he did an okay job, but he's not Constantine, and I think Matt Ryan really uh, that feel of the character. He does sort of bring a Constantine. Like, if you read the Constantine of the current DC universe, he is basically that Constantine, I think. Um, I am actually not really following Constantine, the show, myself, as I was never really uh, too much into the books or the lore, but uh, uh, from everything I've heard from you guys, it, it's definitely uh, building to something great, potentially. So that's that's positive news. Um, okay, uh, so, Rab, um, I'm going to toss it over to you next. Uh you you were actually going to talk about Batman Eternal, if I'm not mistaken. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Uh, so, starting the very week that I am saying this, which may not be the week you see it, but uh, starting with this week, they're coming out with issue 41, which means, mathematically, that it did start in 2014. Uh, I had to check. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, they it's doing a lot of very dramatic things to Gotham that we have not seen before. That is what Batman Eternal is doing. And it's it's a weekly series which is sort of uh, not so much different as new or... I mean, DC hasn't usually done weeklies that weren't part of events or weren't like anthology titles like Action Comics Weekly was. so Or like 52, which was an event. So Batman Eternal is like the first ongoing story that's not an event that I have read slash heard of. <laughs> it's just so hard to follow in the footsteps of Countdown to Final Crisis. Yeah, really. <laughs> so, but in, a, in addition to being one of those, it is doing a lot of weird, interesting things to Gotham that we've never seen before. Like I said... It's giving us a really strong sense of place, of the place that Gotham is. And just, I want to list off all of the crazy things that have happened. So that's going to be full of spoilers. So spoiler alert, crazy things that have happened in Batman Eternal. Alfred's daughter, Julia, is back from comic book limbo and is now working support for the Batman family. Finally. <coughs> Harper Rowe. Years of waiting. Yeah, <laughs> Harper Rowe, who was introduced in uh, in Batman, Scott Snyder's Batman, is now like a team member, more or less. She's hanging out with Red Robin, solving crime. She's going to be some kind of new vigilante. Stephanie Brown is back. Like, we were all wondering when Stephanie Brown was coming back. Now she's back, and I don't know why they thought this was some kind of crazy clever spin on bringing her back, because it's basically just Stephanie Brown as usual, but whatever. Um, Jim Gordon is not the commissioner. He's framed for a crime, so he's not the commissioner. He's in jail. Uh, Catwoman gives up being Catwoman and becomes a mob boss. What? Um, Arkham Asylum destroyed. Arkham moves into Wayne Manor. Like, what is that? And apparently the changes are just going to keep coming. I mean, like... Maybe the way I presented them does not sound as crazy as they are, but when you think back on Batman history, aside from No Man's Land or Batman having to disappear for a while, 
all of this stuff is totally new, says me. What do you guys think the impact of some of these, obviously, the destruction of Arkham uh, seems pretty permanent, but that can be rebuilt. Uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Gordon being uh, locked up or framed, that can be, you know, his name can be cleared, but, um, you know, some of these are going to have longer-reaching impacts. Uh, I think we were just uh, talking about uh, Catwoman 35 and 36, where, you know, she becomes the... the he- we learn a little bit more about who she really is and, and the fact that she's part of a, a crime family. That will have permanent effect. Even if she, you know, leaves the mob, uh, mob family, which I don't know if you can actually do that, but let's say she can... You know the things she does as a part of that will probably have long and permanent, uh, you know, repercussions. What do you guys think this will do, or will they just re- retcon everything to like in a few months, or what's what do you think? Um, I don't know, but I definitely like. I think it's interesting what they're doing there with using it as using like that one, the one weekly book as like a springboard for all these other, for like every other book in the Batman family. So, like, something will start in Eternal with, like, yeah, Catwoman. Catwoman's life changes radically in Batman Eternal and then springboards and someone else takes it up, so another writer takes it up from there. And, I mean, I don't know if Catwoman being a mob boss or Harper Rowe being a member of the team is going to stick around. I mean, those are both cool turns for those characters, but I I just think it's an interesting method. It's uh, it's also worth mentioning that Catwoman's origin story has been kind of all over the place uh, within the modern era. Um, she started out Batman Year One very famously, retconned a lot of her history, and made it so that she started out as a prostitute on the streets of Gotham City, uh, which a lot of people did not like for such a well-beloved character. Um, and then they changed that in Zero Hour. There were a couple years where they made it so that she was just like a street urchin. And then Ed Brubaker in his uh, Catwoman run, that like one of my favorite runs of all time, went back to that, but instead took the position on it that she had been a prostitute and during like a dark time in her life, and now she was this like hero who would speak out for these people who a lot of the time didn't have other people to mm. speak for them. That she protected all of the like uh, street people in uh, Gotham's East End. I just want to touch on briefly about Arkham being, you know, destroyed and them moving all the, the prisoners into Wayne Manor. I think that's kind of a huge symbolic deal that, like, this this one reminder of Bruce Wayne's parents, you know, the, the stately Wayne Manor is now, you know, home to all these crazy and insane people that he, he spends his nights fighting, and now they're kind of living in, in you know, they're kind of corrupting his, his parents, you know, memory or whatever, and I think it's really kind of symbolic of of Gotham corrupting Batman. Wayne Manor, more like insane manor. I think, I think even if they don't stick with some of these changes, they're definitely setting a stage for a more fluid Gotham. Like, in, into 2015, I think way more changes are going to happen. Like, as long as Scott Snyder is still in charge of the Batman things that are happening... He's gonna want to keep shifting the bar around. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, there's never a, a dull moment in the Bat family or in the sort of Bat group of comics. But uh, when they shake things up this much, it's it's gonna have uh, hopefully a positive effect for the readers and and something to you know watch for in 2015. All right, so. Um, We'll keep moving along. We have a lot to talk about in this episode. So, uh, Billy, I'm going to jump over to you. It looks like you're already doing your uh, I've got something to say dance uh, or your I have to tinkle dance. I'm not sure which. Uh They look very similar. Completely interchangeable. Uh, So I think uh, Archie uh, was actually going to be the topic of uh, your your conversation today. Please uh, enlighten us. I think one of the coolest things that we've seen, especially within the last year, but it's been going on for a while, is it feels like there's a big renaissance at RC Comics lately, where I don't know if, if sales were dropping and they're just like taking risks because they're desperately trying to find a new audience base, but it feels like they've been making a lot of big creative changes, trying out all sorts of weird new things with the characters, where for years and years and years, Archie was just basically putting out the same comics for eternity, Uh, but now within the last couple years we've seen the two alternate universes, one where he marries Betty, one where he marries Veronica, and then within the past year they they killed Archie in that story. It's a heartbreaking story um, where he sacrifices himself to protect uh, his friend 
who's a gay man uh, running for the Senate. Uh, very, very powerful read. Um, and then also another thing that's been incredible is they've started the Archie Horror line, which is like my favorite thing in comics right now. Uh, two books coming out, uh, Afterlife with Archie, the Archie characters in a zombie apocalypse, which is amazing. They do all the tropes perfectly, all of the humor that you're used to with Archie, but everything is told as a very creepy, very spooky uh, zombie apocalypse story with amazing art by uh, Francesco Francavilla. Uh, and then on top of that, they also just launched uh, a new Sabrina book. What is it? The uh, the chilling adventures of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and that yeah, has also been different. fantastic. It seems like they're doing a lot of more things in that direction. Oh, we also have a uh, new Archie number one coming out later on this year by legendary comic writer Mark Wade. I'm really excited about that. I'm excited to see the things they're going to keep doing into the future. Oh yeah, Archie. Archie for me has been, as you say, sort of one of those background characters and. You know, you, you go to the, the checkout stand in the grocery store and there's always an Archie there kind of thing. Like, it's it's omnipresent, but it's never in the mainstream media. However, yeah. that story that you mentioned, um, you know, not only did he die, which is the first time he's done that, really, as far as I know, anyone really in that universe has done that, I think. Um, but anyway, um, uh, certainly powerful that he died, but then for the sort of politically motivated or charged or, or controversial topic, which is to protect the life of a a gay man, so that's uh, fantastic, and a, it shows that they're breaking out of the mold to capture a, not only a new audience, but to reinvigorate the, the existing audience, so I completely lot, agree. Very interesting stuff for 2014. A lot of people criticize that as being just kind of like a like a shocker move that he would die to protect a gay friend as some, like, I don't know, like trying to attract the Tumblr crowd or whatever, but really, if you read the story, it's not, it doesn't feel like they're just trying to, like it's a cheap publicity move. It feels like a really sensitive story dealing with the last chapter of a very beloved character. Well, it's, it's funny you should say that, because every time some publisher decides to deal with a controversial topic, whether it was organic from a story that had been building for a period of time, or whether it was uh, something that, you know, was a very timely, whether it was, uh, you know, the 9-11 attacks, or when uh, North Star uh, got married, the uh, first gay marriage in comics, I think that was a few years back now, but uh, same point. Everyone said, oh, well, it's, you know, shock, or, oh, well, you're just dealing with it now because the topic's already in the mainstream media. And the answer is, yeah, so? It's who relevant. Cares? Yeah, who cares? I got into, I got into so many arguments about the new Thor being a girl, where people said, oh, it's just like a cheap move to get girls. To, who cares? Girls should be reading more comics, and it's great that they're doing things to make girls read more comics. Why are you angry about that? And if the storytelling is good, and if the art is good, and the story makes sense, which it does, we you know kind of talked about it earlier, but it doesn't matter. And if uh, it, it just bothers me, but anyway, we're going to move along onto a happier topic. So that was definitely a, a, a solid moment in 2014. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to actually just uh, talk briefly about one of my, and it's not really a particular moment, but it's sort of the whole year uh, has been, in my opinion, uh, sort of the year of the Marvel movie. I mean, you had Captain America, you uh, Winter Soldier, you had Amazing Spider-Man 2, you had Days of Future Past, you had Guardians of the Galaxy, and whether you believe it was a uh, movie first, comic, you know, later kind of thing, uh, Big Hero 6, which was also very popular. Um, there was uh, the number one movie of the year, Guardians of the Galaxy, which I just literally re-watched last night just because... Uh, I was looking it up, and I was just like, oh, I just got to watch it again. Uh, very funny, you know, pushed the boundaries in a different way for the Marvel Universe. Still continued the storyline on, but definitely, uh, you know, added a flavor of and a humor that we haven't seen before um, in, in the Marvel movies, perhaps with the exception of maybe some of Iron Man's sort of quirkiness. Uh, Captain America was, uh, Winter Soldier was a very interesting movie to me personally. I thought it was probably the first Marvel movie uh, that had no superheroes in it. It was all... It was like a spy movie to me, is the way I, I kind of look at it. And um, great movie. Uh, you know, you had uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2, which didn't do so well. Uh, it made money positively, you know, like it was a financial success, but it wasn't a critical success. And it, it right now is, you know, a little bit in terms of uh, the future of that particular Sony reboot. Um, uh, called into question, you know, the future of Andrew Garfield and the character and that that storyline. But all in all, I thought it was good. 
Uh, and then uh, Days of Future Past, which, you know, some would say uh, X-Men First Class really saved the X-Men franchise over at Fox, but uh, I would say this cemented it and, and really is now going to be the launching pad for uh, future, like, X-Men uh, Apocalypse, uh, which is coming in two years. So, um, you know, I think there was a lot of uh, positive things to talk about, not just financial success, but very busy year over at Marvel. Next year, I think there's going to be three movies, uh, Age of Ultron, Ant-Man, and uh, Fantastic Four, if that survives. Um, and then the year after that is going to be another massive one, Deadpool, Captain America 3, X-Men Apocalypse, Doctor Strange, Sinister Six, and uh, my personal favorite of the, the whole lot, Gambit. Uh, we'll see what Channing Tatum has to say. But the idea, the idea that it was a Marvel movie year was fantastic, and um, uh, it's the their momentum is not slowing down, and that it's I think it bodes well for DC too. Um, just you know, getting people into the medium is positive for the whole industry, not just for Marvel. Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's it's sort of amazing that they haven't slowed down at all. Like Iron Man one was two thousand eight, like so it's been a while, and they're still going strong. It's and Age of Ultron coming up. That's gonna that's gonna be a monster. So I'm excited. They've really set a precedent for this sort of shared like universe situation that you like making movies like comic books are. That is sort of what we like. I mean, that's what we're looking forward to as comic book fans. But I think the the appetite for that maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe like people who were comic book fans are now movie fans. I mean, are now old enough to be watching these movies. That doesn't make sense. But anyway... (laughs) I love that we're seeing a lot more superhero genre movies, where it feels like for a very long time... It bothers me when people call superhero a genre. Like, people get mad that there are so many superhero movies coming out, because I think people assume all superhero stories are that, like, Superman, guy with cape, flying brick type thing. <clears throat> but no, we're seeing Captain America 2, superhero movie is political thriller, we're having Ant-Man coming out, superhero movie is heist movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, sci-fi comedy. There's so much potential there. So, uh, we'll jump back to Justice now. I think, Justice, you wanted to tell us a little bit about Magneto, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, great character, and uh, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, real quick. Yeah, uh, so Magneto, he's a character I sort of have a complicated relationship with. I really love him when he's written well, and uh, but he can be frustrated. I'm not a huge fan of Magneto as a good guy. It doesn't make as much sense to me. So, again, when they said they were doing a Magneto solo series, I was kind of skeptical because it's like, well, what are they going to do? Um, but uh, Cullen Bunn has just blown it out of the water with just sort of showing his downfall from being on and the like one of the main X-Men teams to going back to being a villain and showing that process, showing him out on his own, away from the X-Men, and how he just can't help but be a monster. And it's kind of and I mean, but at the same time he's a he's a fun monster. He, you know, fucks up Oh, no. Terrible. Time. But, I mean, it's it's just this, this great character piece and this great arc of him and his, I would say downfall, but just sort of becoming who he can't help from being. And it's, I love it. I love it a lot. It's really good. I'm going to just interrupt for just a, a brief second, if I can. Um... Actually, uh, I, know, I don't know if you can see it in the background there. I'll, I'll cut to it in a second. But the bat symbol has just appeared, and uh, <laughs> Billy actually has to go. Uh, not, you know, spoiler alert, Billy is actually Batman. But uh, if we could all just say a quick goodbye to Billy. Uh, and, Billy, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I got to duck out. Good year, everybody. Bye. <laughs> goodbye. Happy 2014. So actually, I'm going to um, toss it over now to uh, Kyle. Kyle, I think you uh, wanted to tell us a little bit about why Green Lantern was a, not only an important topic for 2014, but why you liked it so much. Yeah, uh, Green Lantern and uh, Green Lantern Corps uh, have been kind of working together, uh, writing between the two books, uh, Van Jensen and uh, Robert Vendetti. And it's it's just been this, this massive uh, kind of crossover between the two books. 
And I think it actually started before 2014, but 2014 was really when it kind of built and it kind of meshed together. And the whole idea is that, like, for years, the Green Lantern Corps has been involved with all these massive events. There was the, the you know, the War of the Light and then the Blackest Night with the, the Black Lanterns. And then we get all that worked out, and, you know, it, the New 52 comes, and we're still dealing with Black Lanterns. And we get the first Lantern, and we get, like, and all of these things are massive, you know, universe-wide, end-of-the-world, end-of-the-universe type things that the Green Lantern Corps is wrapped up in. And we finally get a chance with this where it's not the end of the universe. It's still a massive event. The Green Lantern Corps is being attacked by unknown enemies. They're being infiltrated and impersonated by the Durlins. Uh, the Outer Clans are attacking them, and uh, you know the Coons are involved. So there's all these enemies working to undermine the Green Lantern Corps and their, uh, their authority to police the universe, and they're kind of taking over territory. And it was really great to see an event that felt massive and big, but didn't feel like it was the end of the universe. It was just a, a kind of character, kind of team-centric book that wasn't, you know, like if we don't solve this, nothing will exist anymore. It, it was nice to have that kind of, you know, kind of step down in intensity, but still feel like it was big and important. What, what would you say is the state of the cosmic universe in the DC universe right now uh, in terms of events that are going on, in terms of, you know, um, problems that exist in sort of deep space and and uh, galactic influence of uh, sort of cosmic events. Would you say it's relatively quiet on that front right now, or would you say that, say, multiversity or something like that is kicking cosmic up a bit? Well, I mean, the Green Lantern Corps right now is kind of at their lowest point. Half the universe doesn't trust them anymore after the events of, you know, the the Durlins and the, the others impersonating and, and kind of attacking them. They also just faced the New Gods, uh, had a massive battle with the New Gods. All the cores had to come together, which was a big deal. But, I mean, you, so you've got, in our universe, our main universe, you've got all this going on in space, but at the same time, like you mentioned, multiversity is going on. And I don't think yet that that book has really kind of shown the big threat, you know, to each universe. But it, it's kind of building as each book progresses, and you kind of you kind of see the pieces of of a larger thing building, but you aren't quite aware of the entire threat yet, and especially what that means to our main universe. Yeah, but that's kind of beyond cosmic. Like, that's sort of what. DC deals in not so much the cosmic universe of DC as the multiversal thing, especially with multiversity the way it's set up. With the, I mean, if you've seen the map, you see how they've got all of the new, the Earth set up in this little circle in the thing called the Bleed, and then outside of that, that's where the new gods exist, and so they're they're a separate entity unto themselves that exist outside of all multiverses. <laughs> And it's just, what is this? I, I, oh, there's no cosmic seven. universe. The cosmic universe is the Green Lantern Corps and maybe Lobo. That's that's the cosmic <laughs> universe in DC. Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a headache right now. I, I'm hoping you know as as more of the multiversity books come out, and hopefully the guidebook will kind of give us a a little bit of an idea what all this means. Because that map that map I think just confused things more than anything. I don't have a copy of that map. I've seen that map several times. They're selling it at conventions or whatever, but I don't have a copy of that map. It's a sure. cool map. Yeah, it does look like a cool map. Who actually do? Who actually drew it? Uh, Ryan Hughes? Re Ryan Hughes? I don't know how to pronounce it, but he's... I think it's just Ryan. Ryan. Isn't Ryan. it like R-I-O-N-N -N or something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, just Some curious. friend of Grant Morrison. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's uh, let's move on to uh, our second and last topic of the night, or se second or third last. Um, we want to talk about Rab being a sex criminal. Uh, Rab, tell us all about that. I'm not a sex criminal. I'm a brimper, um, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, anyway, sex criminals. I think it started in like late 2013, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway because that's sort of when it came into came into its own, I suppose. Like, 
They've been a big player sort of in the background of comic books for most of 2014. So even though they sort of started off a little slow, like with a book called Sex Criminals, people are maybe wary of it. I mean, it's sensational also, but then it blows up into this huge thing where like the first issue has had four print runs at least, and it's sold out, all of them. So... But anyway, it's a it's a funny book, and it's sometimes a touching book in a non-sexy way. <laughs> that, but it gets real about sex and love, and like ways that other mediums are not willing to be real about sex, and that's pretty cool. Um, but it's under the guise of a book that's about people who stop time and by having orgasms and then rob banks. But that's like a lie. That's the hook. It tricks you into getting the book because you think, ooh, that's an interesting premise slash sensational. And then and then it, if you're the kind of person who's into that, it becomes this sort of mature book about relationships with the occasional immature dick joke. And I think that that plus the humor is what makes it like an Eisner winning title that sells out all its books and even if Sex Criminals is a ridiculous title, it, I think it has, it deserves better than the sh- scorn that it might get from prudish people. So yeah. you, you haven't mentioned who it's by, which is uh, oh. Matt Fraction and, and Chip Zdarsky. Chip is going on to do uh, Howard the Duck, but tell us a little bit about that sort of, that combo. Like, I mean, they've obviously put their own flavor on that book. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, Matt Fraction is... Has a has a history like he's the guy who did Hawk or not Haw- Hawkeye yes Hawkeye he's married to Kelly Sue DeConnick apparently he used to be an addict of some kind I mean he's got a real life history and I think he's bringing a lot of his own personal autobiographical stuff into this book and he's bringing stories from other people's lives like finding porn in the woods this is according to the letters section this is like a universal thing. Finding porn in the woods, and I, I'm, I I don't think I found any, but I may have left some. <laughs> they, <laughs> but they've built this huge audience of people who write into their letters section, which is growing to be like six pages long. Or and Chip Zdarsky has he, he, people might know him as like the guy who had a funny thing with Applebee's on Facebook for a while, but he's um, a magical thing with Applebee's. It, it was a great thing, and he is. He is just a silly man. I mean, like, Matt Fraction brings a lot of realness to the book, but I think he brings a lot of the silly, like, secret jokes in the background. I, I think they're, they're both they're both silly men, I think, but I think together they make a silly book that is really hitting home. You, you can tell he's silly because he makes up a name like Chip Zdarsky, which, by the yeah. way, is not his real name. <laughs> yes. Something like... I, I actually don't want to say a, a name because it's it's something very normal. Very, but Chip Zdarsky, what a fun name! I like it. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, I love that book too. Just so so very much. I actually just bought the the book of just the sex tips that they put in the letters column, and it's called Just the Tips, and it's the funniest thing I own. It's just this little pink book. That's just full of the filthiest, worst things, and it's amazing. It's oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, he actually is promoting that book, and I, I just uh, I was following him on Twitter, and he was doing a book signing. Chip, Chip was at a uh, adult uh, store uh, for that book, and you could just see pictures of what they call it <laughs> adult adult paraphernalia behind him, and he's just sitting there signing his. Just the tip book and all these women, uh, just you know, uh, who obviously are fans of the either the series or that book. But uh, no, it's a silly little series that is not silly at all in so far as it is great, and it has had a lot of critical success as well. So um, check it out if you haven't. Uh, Sex Criminals, uh, like Reb said, uh, it's about a year in now and um, still going strong. So, Justice, um, I uh, I understand that you've rediscovered or discovered perhaps for the first time Valiant Comics. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your experience was that uh, with Valiant in 2014? Why yeah, you thought it was uh, I actually, 
early on in this year, I bought their uh, the Humble Bundle of Valley of Comics, which I I got to admit, confession, I cheaped out on it. I didn't go for any of the stretch goals. I just paid a buck, and I got a bunch of comics. And I was like, okay, it's a bunch of comics for a buck. How could this possibly go wrong? And then it turned out really great. Like, I've just been sort of binging all... Like, they've got a lot of really fun series. they got Archer and Armstrong, which is like a fun adventure thing. Uh, Quantum and Woody, which is like a funny superhero deal. Bloodshot, who's like Wolverine, but his blood can hack computers. Uh... Makes sense. Exo Man of War is like if Conan the Barbarian got an Iron Man suit and everything went about as poorly as you would expect from that. That's an old uh, but what I wanna, title. Yeah. Uh, but what I particularly want to talk about, because it came out in the end of 2014, is uh, The Valiant, which is the, the start of their new publishing initiative by uh, Jeff Lemire, Matt Kidd, and art by uh, Pablo Rivera. It's uh, It's had one issue so far, and it's real good. It's just like Jeff Lemire is, it's, it's, what's happened so far is it's just been establishing, but uh, it's just setting up Bloodshot as like maybe the next protector of the Earth or something, and uh, it's all this, this crazy monster thing called the Eternal, the Immortal Enemy. It's like this crazy face-splitting monster thing. It's it's, I can't even explain it. It's awesome. Go like just Google it, and you'll be like, "Oh man, I want to read stories about that monster." Super rad. Check it out. Jeff Lemire, he's cool. Uh, yeah, I heartily recommend it. Heartily, heartily. heartily. Thank heartily. you very much, Justice. So we've talked about a lot today. Actually, we've talked about Moon Knight, Magneto, Valiant, Batman, Internal, Sex Criminals, Constantine, Green Lantern, uh, the Renaissance of Archie. Uh, I talked about uh, the sort of year of Marvel movies uh, and sort of, uh, you know, just awesomeness in general. Um, but um, one thing we haven't talked about and we haven't really done it a little bit of an introspective, and that's uh, the Comic Book Showcase, our show right here. Um, this is episode 24, and don't be too sad, it's just the season finale. Uh, we'll be back shortly with uh, what we'll call season two. But uh, I did want to run down uh, just a few uh, highlights about our, our show this year. Um, we've been running for just about a year, even though we took a couple of brief pauses there for conventions and, and whatnot, but um, uh, we've had a, a number of great successes. We've had uh, a great crew of people. I'd like to thank everybody uh, that has uh, joined us, uh, some that were able to join us for this episode, some that were not, uh, Alana and Mike uh, specifically, who weren't uh, able to join us for this episode, uh, Billy slash Batman, um, who had to uh, run and save the day. Um, but also, obviously, Mike and, uh, sorry, Kyle and Rab and Justice, who's uh, new uh, to the crew. Uh, thank you all, first of all. It's been a, a fantastic year, so I do want to thank you. But we've had um, a number of great episodes, some with some incredible success and, and some great feedback from everybody. Uh, we are just now roughly approaching 100,000 views of our episodes, so thank you to you, the audience. Uh, we, we, we hope that you're enjoying our show, and we're going to continue producing new episodes and new content for you. And uh, to that end, uh, we have some some announcements to, to make uh, momentarily, but uh, just a couple of episodes I wanted to call out. If you haven't watched them, uh, I'd like to, you know, suggest you watch uh, Death in Comics, which was episode number two, if I'm not mistaken, uh, When Heroes Kill, which is 14, Gender Benders and Race Lifts, which was 16, and uh, Drunk Detective Comics 27. This was Billy's idea where we actually got sloshed and discussed the first appearance of Batman, uh, which, now that we know Billy is Batman, was oddly self-serving, uh, but um, these are some of the episodes that we had some of the greatest reaction, some of them a little bit more controversial, some of them just because, uh, you know, a little more funny or, or more interesting, but um, uh, I'd like to suggest you go check those out and hopefully watch all the other videos as well, um, but we'd like to thank you for a great year. Uh, something we're going to be doing in the next uh, year, Season 2, Obviously, more of the great, uh, same witty banter between the, the group of us. Um, we are going to introduce two new things, however, into Season 2. The first is special guests. Uh, we actually have a number of great, uh, interesting special guests lined up to uh, hopefully uh, inspire new conversations and, and add a fresh voice to the, these, these conversations. Um, and uh, so be watching for special guests in Season 2 but also some side videos, some side projects 
where we'll talk about a particular individual issue or a character or a story arc and or where we'll just uh, discuss a specific issue that we just read and just kind of go through either page by page or piece by piece uh, on that particular comic. So stay tuned for these sort of side videos that will be posted um, irregularly, not on a particular schedule, but um, watch for those as well. So anyway, this is my name is Jamie Hari, and this has been a, a great year, and thank you very much to everybody. We'd love for you to tell us what you thought of our season uh, and specifically what you would like to suggest for season two. So please do so in the comments and join us again in season two in just a few weeks uh, for more great comic book conversation and uh, an insight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rab. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Mike and Elena, and Batman slash Billy. Take care. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Comic Book Showcase. Join us again live via chat or Twitter next week. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And to learn more about today's topics, check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia, the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere.